Okay. Well, thank you all for coming <coughs> tonight, and some of you for coming again after, after yesterday. What uh, um, I'm going to do is to try and give you uh, not necessarily the other side of the coin, but one of the other possible faces of um, a person's life and the way in which he interacts with friends, with colleagues, and with people that he does not uh, know as yet. So my, um, also my relationship with Aldo Jurkol is very personal because I met him when I was a student, like you, backpacking around Australia. At my professor at the University of Rome, what I was trying, suggested that I may actually want to go and visit Canberra because at that time, the largest public building in the world was being built by a New York Roman architect by the name of Aldo Jurgla. So I went there, and the, the, first, the, sentence, the first sentence I remember about Canberra was, would you like to meet Aldo? And I was in the office looking at the model, and this was his personal assistant. Aldo was there in Canberra by himself, and he was told that there were two architectural students eager to see the, to visit the site. So he came out of his office and said, would you like to go on site? Then we ended up going to his place, first stopping at a local supermarket, getting some pasta, some tomato sauce. And then we spent the rest of the night cooking a bowl of pasta, and eventually, well, the rest is history. I spent a week there, and possibly I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that encounter. So I'll try to explain to you how and why by taking essential, trying to take you through, in fact, not through, but to this building from, from a long time before this building was implemented. I'm from Rome. I train in the School of Architecture in Rome, which was the same place where Aldo Jurgola was born and trained. And I think that possibly this is one of the reasons that essentially made that encounter so fruitful and seemingly natural. Some of you may know that this is a very famous archaeological map of Rome. In fact, it's the first modern archaeological map of Rome uh, produced by Rodolfo Lanciani in 1901. And the reason why this map was produced is because Rome was experiencing a great process of urban upheaval had become a capital in 1870, and so the entire infrastructure of the capital had to be, Rome was never a capital, had to be built from scratch, from 1880s essentially, all the way to the 19-teens. And so this was an archaeological map that was produced scholarly for the first time in order to understand where, what were the Roman pre-existences in, uh, in black, what was the existing modern fabric? You can't see it here, but it's in red. And what was the infrastructure, the road system that was to be planned for the new Rome, which is in light blue? So you have an archaeological map that overimposes a number of layers of the city. What's this red circle? This is where Aldo Jurgola was born in 1920. So you have a street here which is the modern Via del Corso. You have the Campidoglio here, and this will become Via dei Fori Imperiali in the 1920s and 30s. And in the 30s in particular, Mussolini will start the process called sventramento, the gutting of the center of the city in order to replace Renaissance Rome with the new imperial city. Aldo Giurgola was born in 1920. So he was there as a child, as a kid, whilst the city was being turned upside down and whilst the center of Rome was an entire demolition site first and construction site second. So you can imagine a kid roaming around this part of Rome, looking at the hills, looking at the Campidoglio, looking at the crepit buildings, looking at columns coming out of the ground and looking at construction <coughs> equipment and people from, from the countryside coming in to build the new Rome. In fact, his building no longer exists. 
was demolished in the 1940s, and they had to move to another part of Rome. Now, next to that building, there was a small church, which is this one here, called by accident San Romualdo. And Romualdo happens to be the patron of travelers. And in my conversations with Aldo, he always said, look, my name is not Romualdo. My name is Romaldo. Remember, there is no you in my name. That saint is another person. Keep this in mind. Um, so essentially, what I'm trying to make you imagine that at that time, Aldo Giurgola would be someone that had the privilege of experiencing firsthand what Giovanni Battista Piranesi was trying to show in his map of Rome that had been done 170 years earlier, in which he uses the fragments of the imperial city, the real one, and tries to put them together in a sort of trompe l'oeil composition in order for people to understand what the parts of the city were, but above all, how all these fragments related to the topography of the city. On the other hand, Portuguese, as I'm, I'm sorry, not Portuguese, Piranesi was also trying to be capricious in a way with its own, uh, with its own renditions of the city and imagine Rome as a, as a fictional entity that would actually be made, I mean, fictional but composed, comprised of real elements which were the fragments of that plan and this was the plan of Campo Marzio made for his friend Adam in, uh, uh, in England. London. The thing is that Piranesi's, uh, Piranesi's interest for people in that, at that time in Rome was actually quite high. Through the various academies and through the rising interest in antiquities and in conservation as a new, as a new science. So this particular plan, which is the plan of Rome uh, done by Piranesi in the 1750s, which is the bottom part of it, is a very unique plan because it brings together the topography of the city, the lie of the land, and the infrastructure. In fact, it's called the plan, the map of the aqueducts. So you see Rome, you see the water, you see the hills. Finally, you understand where the seven hills are. You see the, the places of collective memory, if you will, and you can see all the infrastructure. So a city doesn't exist without its land and without the elements that connect it. On the other side, Porto, uh, Piranesi, once again, in his books on Roman antiquities, a third and fourth volume in particular, goes and look at fictional renditions of those monuments and the construction of those. And this particular thing is interesting because on the one hand, he sort of privileges the fictional monumentality of the various places. This is the, the um, Castel Sant'Angelo. So these are the, ostensibly the foundations of Castel Sant'Angelo. And then it says, look, in a Roman time, in, a, in an ideal time, everything would have been exposed, and these are tourists. So this is the scale. These are tourists looking at the magnificence of the Romans. But Piranesi, with his son, Francesco, was also an archaeological um, investigator. Of the, of the history of the city. So these are some of the things that uh, Francesco um, made. So the surveys of the Pantheon, and then the surviving Roman structures contained within the buildings. So once again, there is this attempt to bring together, even in Pyrenees' time, so here we're talking about 1750s, 1760s, uh, to bring together a new city by understanding the layers that compose it. Now, Giurgola would also have been able to do this as a young man, because if he cared to walk essentially 300 meters north of his house, he would have come across this particular building. So this is the, the profile of the actual building, which is the House of Parliament of Rome, which is also called for, by Romans Monte Citorio, which in Latin means the mound where things in excess uh, are put. So essentially, it's a tip. And that's the reason why he was actually made into a mound, into a monte, because in the center 
when the Romans were actually building the Renaissance, uh, well, yeah, Romans geographically, building the Renaissance city and the harbor that was here, everything that was not needed for construction was dumped here. And because of that, in that part of the city, there is a slight incline. So as you move towards the parliament building, you feel that you're actually ascending, even though you may not actually see it. But there is, once again, there is a, a topography by stealth, if you will, that is actually produced through the inhabitation of the place. Now, these was, were the things that one would have gone through as a young man. And eventually, the experience of the city would have been... Uh, sort of uh, consolidated and reinforced through the community, through his own community. The people that decided to go into architecture school in Rome but were stopped by the war because he started architecture in the early 40s, the school, in the, I'm sorry, the very late 30s, the university was closed, all the architects and engineers were sent to the um, to the um, uh, Court of Civil Engineers in northern Italy, near Milano, and this is Aldo Giurgola, as a 20-year, 22-year-old man, with all these other um, you know, partners in crime that happened to be young engineers and young architects. In particular, there was this sort of um, mix of architects coming from Rome and architects coming from Milano, the two great schools, of intellectual school of thought in Italy, that paradoxically found a moment of communion here during the war as well as during the construction of the Universal Exposition of Rome, the EUR, where both the Roman officers and the Milanese officers came down to produce a number of buildings and used the work of the students of the architectural students. And it was a critical moment in the history of the next generation of architects in Italy because there was a, a place and a time for them to experience construction and experience contiguity with the masters. Now this is the first uh, known uh, public project that we know of Aldo Giurgola, which according to some is the final thesis, according to himself is a final thesis. According to people that studied with him and that are part of the same photograph, it was not his thesis, but rather a conservation project done as a group. In fact, we found the original drawings in someone else's archive, which seems to reinforce the thesis. But anyway, so this is the, I'm sorry. So this is Rome. This is a project in Rome. This is San Peter, Via della Conciliazione, which was, had been just uh, finished. And there is a small building here, which is a convent, Il Palazzo dei Penitenzieri. And it was actually offered as a conservation project by the, you know, the old doyans of the School of Architecture. So either by himself or with a number of people, they took up this project, took on this project and m turned them into their thesis. Now, when you look at the Palazzo dei Penitenzieri from this particular perspective, this is a Giurgola's drawings, you can see that it's not drawn or rendered graphically as one building. But either you know, by coincidence, serendipitously, or because the, of the effective position of the building on the street, along Via della Conciliazione and along the Lungo Tevere, there is the river here, it's two buildings. One along Via della Conciliazione with San Peter here, and another one along the Lungo Tevere and next to the church of Santo Spirito in Sassia. By the way, this is an American uh, map that was actually used for bombing Rome. So they had all these photographs to make sure that they wouldn't bomb this area and they could actually bomb to the southeast, which in fact happened in 1944. Um, if we go and look at the, at the interior of this particular proposal, this is the atrium of the convent and this is a Jurgola drawing. This is an interesting drawing because I don't have, unfortunately, the photograph to show you about the rest of the work. But it is a drawing that shows one central point in it. And that within buildings, there are two spaces. There is a space for construction. You can see the vaulting and the tying of the columns. And there is a space for social interaction, for culture, which is the lower part. So. This building, this space is made out of two parts. What you need in order to make this happen and what you want to happen. 
as part of the community. You will find this as a late motive on Aldo Jurgola's work. Now, after that, he actually went into a partnership with one of his friends from school, Claudio Dall'Olio, a fairly well-known architect, but also with someone else by the name of Adalberto Libera. He was someone slightly older than him, very famous as a rationalist architect, that used these two young architects, Claudio Dall'Olio and um, Giorgola, I'm not saying to exploit them, but certainly to use their unusual skills, um, drafting-wise as well as compositionally. So this is a competition that I think they won, I think in 1947, for a sea colony right after the war. But that didn't last long because Jurgola had different ideas. And his friend, Claudio de Loli, was very close to the movement of organic architecture, which in those years was being revamped by the, by the coming back of the historian Bruno Zevi from America. So he came back from America and uh, became very active in the movement, which was essentially led by the Fulbright Commission to throw a bridge between Italy, Italy and the United States. So this is Senator William Fulbright, a young senator, I think from North Carolina, if I remember correctly, that says it is possible, 1948, not very probable, but possible, that people can find in themselves through intercultural education the ways and means of living together in peace. And it's interesting that a few years later, there is a Time magazine cover that says, William Fulbright, how to relate self-interest and the preservation of freedom. Be that as it may, whatever the, uh, whatever the objectives of the Fulbright program were, they worked successfully, essentially through Bruno Zevi and a young woman named Cipriana Schelba, that we can see here with Senator Fulbright, and here we see uh, Zevi with Frank Lloyd Wright in Venice a few years later. But Zevi, as an historian, or the architectural historian, is critical, is central to this story, because as the urban legend goes, they were all at a party near Via Veneto. So a little bit like the party that we went to last night. And Giurgola went to this party. Cipriana Schilba approached him with Zevi and said, would you be interested in going to America? And he said, well, I haven't thought about it, but why not? And of course, it was on partly disingenuous because as I've shown you yesterday, there was an interest in America that had started right after the end of the war in 1946, when the United States Information Agency had started to work with Roman architects, in order, a Milanese architect, in order to produce the handbook, which, was, which came out in 1952. This is a balloon frame rendi Italian rendition in the handbook, and this is a Conrad Waxman um, uh, sort of modified balloon frame component, which certainly Jurgol had been very close to. Be that as it may, it decides to go for the scholarship, for the Fulbright, and it becomes the first architectural Fulbright in Italy. In 1950, he's accepted at Columbia University, and he goes through a year of studies. This is his record at Columbia University. The marks have been cancelled because, erased because, you know, confidentiality reasons, not by me, but by Columbia University. But one thing that you can see is that uh, the curriculum is very simple. You can't possibly use that as a way of furthering your architectural education. The reason why going to Columbia was um, critical was not for the curricula, was not so much for the studies, but maybe in the same way as here, is for the people that you encounter, that you meet, either as instructors, as teachers, or as, or as partners in crime. So this was one, was one of them, Mimo Rotella, which was another, who was another Italian Fulbrighter, a very, very famous artist eventually from southern Italy that went down to Kansas, I think, and eventually became quite famous for his renditions of, uh, uh, re renditions of pop art through Arte Povera. This is myself taking a photograph in Aldo Giurgola's house in Canberra a few years ago, and this is one of the Arte Povera. Um, artworks done by Mimo Rotella in the 1950s. After this, he went back. He had to go back to Italy because, as some of you may know, with the Fulbright visa, you have to return to your country and you have to stay in your country at least for two years before going back to the United States. 
which Jurgola had no intention of doing, but there was someone that had caught his attention. And the name of this man was Paul Rudolf, that Jurgola had met in New York. And so Paul Rudolf, they used to call Jurgola the boy from the golden hands because of his ability to um, draw, kept looking for a job. And finally, he got Jurgola a job at Cornell University. So he was on holiday in Ischia and Capri with his very fresh wife. He gets his, this message from this cable from, uh, from Rudolf to go move to America. They don't even go back to Rome. They go to Naples to the American consulate and they get ipso facto the uh, removal of the two-year prescription from his visa and they go back to Cornell. Cornell is great um, stomping grounds for Jurgola, but he wants to be at the center of the scene. He's very curious, curious as a young man and so he wants to go back. And eventually Paul Rudolph will bring him, will take him, or will enable his arrival at Penn State. I'm sorry, not Penn State, I'm sorry. University of Pennsylvania, under the leadership of G. Holmes Perkins, the legendary dean that will eventually form the school, the Philadelphia School. In the meantime, he had to find the way to eat. And what does he find with the help of Paul Rudolph? Well, he becomes the graphic editor of Interiors magazine from 1953, I think, from 1952 to 1954 or 53, 55. And these are some of the cover pages that he designs himself in the mid-1950s, waiting to go down to Cornell University. Now, why am I showing you these things? Well, the reason is that... Um, it shows that there, are, there is a person with a number of different interests and an ability to understand, in a sense, the cultural disposition and the cultural directions, even of a country and a society and a culture that was not his own. After a while, he decides that he doesn't have much time to do it, and so he has to look for an assistant. Who would that assistant be? And so he looks at a young man with blonde hair by the name of Andy Worrell, who was 25 at the time. And Aldo Jurgola gives Andy Worrell his first job as a graphic designer in New York in 1955, I think. And since then, Andy Worrell keep, kept sending him uh, Christmas cards that were actually drawn by himself with happy, of course he wouldn't say happy Christmas, happy December, Aldo Jurgola. Now we go back, we go, you know, we move forward one or two years and we can see that this sort of um, process of assimilation, if you will, and conquer on the other side comes full circle because Mimo Rotella, that had come to America with him in the 1950s, 1950s um, also becomes a successful artist in the wake of those who've introduced popular art, popular imagery in their arts. And so this is Mimmo Rotella's rendition of Andy Worrell's um, portraits of Marilyn. So this is one thing. On the other hand, he's actually moving in slightly more architectural circles. So in those years, it becomes very good friends with another Italian. You know, migrants tend to stick together. I would say. Even though this was a much, uh, much longer time migrant, and it's Costantino Nivola. Costantino Nivola had been in the United States for quite some time, and of course had designed the Olivetti showroom in New York. Giurgol and Nivola come up with this long friendship, particularly in the Hamptons, where Nivola has a house. And he is a very active member of the Hampton Society. So active that in 1950, he brings Le Corbusier to his house during his legendary trip to America. And of course, this particular conjunction is critical here because Nivola is the one that designed the hand, the open hand for Chandigarh with Le Corbusier. And so Le Corbusier, Nivola makes a 
a portrait of Le Corbusier at Long Island in the 1950s, which he gives to Aldo Giurgola con amicizia, with friendship, in 1966. By then, Giurgola's metabolization of America, I would say, is complete. And he goes, he, he, con he continues his work at, um, he arrives at, um, at, I'm sorry, arrives at uh, University of Pennsylvania, and continues his work at the University of Pennsylvania within an environment which ha turns out to be very, very fertile for him, because there are other people that have roamed in that mind as much as he had and as much as he had experienced. So, of course, this is Piranesi's Ponte uh, Fabrizio from the fourth book of the Roman Antiquities, 19, uh, 1756. But who's using Piranesi at that time in, at the University of Pennsylvania? Well, this is someone that we also found here, possibly by looking into the same sources of inspiration that, um, that will drive us back to um, Rome. And then, of course, there was another one. This is a postcard that Robert Venturi made himself and sent to Aldo Giurgola in those years. So what was happening at the University of Pennsylvania at the time, that when he arrived, he found this group of people as his colleagues, in some cases as mentors, but as colleagues and friends. Louis Munford, Robert Geddes, Ian Mackay, Edmund Bacon, Kahn, Dennis Scott Brown, Venturi, Le Ricolet, Commandant. So you have urban studies, architectural uh, theorists, structural engineers. And so in 1961, someone in progressive architecture defined this group of people as the Philadelphia School under an article that was called Wanting to Be. Now, at that time, Jurgola had become an architect and opened up a professional, a professional firm office with Erman Mitchell, in large part thanks to this particular project. It was a competition, to I'm going to talk about, not for long, but uh, about buildings, competitions that he won, buildings that he made as opposed to dreams that he didn't realize. So this is the memorial, the museum, for the Wright brothers in North Carolina that was built in 1958, and this is, that was actually um, had in 1958, and this is Jurgola's sketch for that. Now, it is a very, very innovative building typologically as well in terms of the language used for those particular pavilions. It's so much so that it's become a national monument, it's been listed as part of the national monument. Um, uh, there has been a lot of exegesis about this work. One of the things that people have not said, and I'm very sorry not to be able to show you the, the parallel, is that this building is very, very close structurally and spatially to the Palazzo dei Congressi in Rome that Adalberto Libera was actually designing a building between the early 50s and 1957. So exactly a few years before this was done and with people that Jurgol had been very, very good friends with. I normally have photographs that go with that and show you the structural parallels and some of the solutions that had been found. But you have to take my word for that because they're not in this presentation. Another thing that they did in 1963 was the car park of the University of Pennsylvania at Walnut Street. And this is also a revolutionary um, building. It is a revolutionary building for two reasons, for the most part. The first one is the structural system that is used. So they have a trust, two trust walls that have beams that go behind them, in, in, across them uh, with um, post tensioning. And then on the other side, they have, on the, on the two caps of that, they have a sculptural three-dimensional element that in fact um, um, hides the ramps of the garage, that, of the multi-level car park that the cars have to use. So this is a photograph of the two components. And you, you can see that they actually, they're not, they don't look like one building, but they look like a series of components that address different parts of the street, of the world around them. So you have this three-dimensional capping of the ramp that you can see here. And then you have the two walls that provide the, the bookshelf support for the, for the slabs of the, of the garage. 
these are the two floors, and you can see that this is the, the express, express structural component, and this is the functional component which is hidden by the three-dimensional treatment of the facade. Now this is, I think, my argument is that this is really Roman. And this is part Roman in terms of modern architecture. And in terms of the generation of architects that worked under the masters in Rome between the 30s and the 50s, as well in part in Milano. And one of my one of the one of the ways of proving one of the ways of proving it is to show you another project, which is this one here. This is the School of Architecture in Mendoza, done by a young Italian architect by the name of Enrico Tedeschi, who was a Piero Giurgola in the 1930s and the 1940s at the university within those group of people. Then he went up to Milano and he went with the Milanese architect to Argentina to the University of Northern Tucumán to help the Argentinian government fund a new education system. Then he went down to Mendoza and defined this particular building, which is structurally quite interesting. So much so that it's actually with, um, uh, withstood two major destructive earthquakes without doing anything. This is a simple, simple um, 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 uh, support and allows the, um, uh, so there is a pin here, and these are sort of cruciform um, columns, and it allows the slab to essentially go up and down when the earthquake start, um, strikes. Now the other project that Jurgola did was this one here. Um, the annex of the Philadelphia Life Insurance Company that was completed in 1962. Look how much un American this particular project, given that it is 1962, in relation to what Germany was also saying. So the, the, the party of the elevation of the facade has an internal logic to itself that possibly comes from his own academic upbringing. But look at how the same party of the elevation is actually used to bring everything together. So clearly, in this addition to the building, one of the main concerns is to create the backdrop of the street, the continuity of the street, to restore the continuity of the street, which is possibly something that was lost, that had been lost in Rome with the demolition of the center. Now, it is true that uh, Jurgola might not have been very famous at that particular point in time, but was famous enough in 1965 to be called to Yale to provide a, an essay, uh, a theoretical essay on what he thought about the city. And the, es the name of the essay was Reflections on Buildings and the City, the Realism of the Partial Vision, which was that used to explain what he'd done until then and as a compass, as a filter to understand what he would do next. Now it's interesting that this particular um, project was actually produced for Perspecta 910 in 1965, which at the time had a very young student editor by the name of Robert Stern. And it was Stern that together with other students was actually trying to select who would become the next dean at the School of Architecture at Yale? So Jurgola, Venturi, and um, Charles Moore were the three candidates from what I remember. Eventually, Charles Moore was, was selected, even though Paul Rudolph clearly was, um, was going for Jurgola. But the reason I'm saying that is because that marks an incredibly important, incredibly fertile um, period, professional and academic and intellectual period in his life, that somehow comes to an end between 65 and 66, when he decides to move from Philadelphia in search of other professional abodes, essentially New York. He doesn't get the position at Yale, and so Columbia University calls his prodigal son, son and in 1966 they made him the chair of, um, chairman of the School of Architecture at the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning. And so in 1969, I think, they open up the office in Manhattan. And that marks one of the most fertile um, um, periods in the, life of the, in the life of the office. During this period, there are a number of seminal buildings that are produced, which I think are important because they show how 
extraneous, how foreign it was to the local culture, and yet how successful in embedding these particular ideas into the local scene. I'm showing you this one first, I mean only this sketch here, because there's a Fairchild Center for Life Sciences at Columbia University, which sits right next to the School of Architecture. And even though this is a model that shows the different components, the laboratories and the screening of the building, and then also something that gives you the ability of going through the building and something that allows you to enter the building, what it doesn't say that the GSAP, it's here. So essentially what you see of the building, many of you may know this building, what you see of the building is this part here. And so when you look at the building, you don't see the building as a whole, you actually see the circulation that the building enables you to go through and essentially becomes a funnel, an invitation to go through campus. And this is in fact the spirit of the partial vision, of the realism of the partial vision. And that what this article, written by a relative young academic, says is that at the time where architecture was made out of boxes and objects, what really matters is how we experience the world. And we can only experience the world partially if we do it personally. You can't look at the entire room at the same time. You have to move. And any time you move, you have one vision which is coherent with your position, but it's partial. And so in developing architectural programs, we need to be um, um, mindful of the people that use them, of the people that experience them, and the, experience, the people that experience them from both sides, from outside the building, as part of the fabric of the city, as well from within the building, as users of the fabric of the city. Essentially, the work that is produced after 65 very clearly demonstrate this. Now, how could one come up with this? In conversations with him, so this is uh, essentially part of an oral story that uh, unfortunately stopped um, um, last year. He said, look, someone that lives in Rome has never seen a building as a whole. Only during the 30s when I was looking at EUR, you had clear access that provided you with a final vision of something, but otherwise, if I walk into the historic city, I will only be able to see one fragment of the building, then another one. And coincidentally, Bruno Zevi was saying exactly the same thing in his book, How to Look, How to View Architecture, because this, the, the, the partiality of the vision and the lack of clear access is one of his seven invariants of architecture. Um, the same thing happens on a number of other buildings. Um, this is a very important one. The United Way building in Philadelphia, done in 1971, at the center of one of the major intersections in Philadelphia. And this is a building that in 1971 decides to become the product of three different elevations. Three different elevations that respond to the context of the city on each side of the building, as well as to the position of the sun. So on the one hand, to accommodate the urban condition, and on the other, to maximize the comfort of, of the people and the functions that will work inside. This is another masterpiece, Penn Mutual Tower, Philadelphia, 1975, in which a great height tower is actually integrated with the one coexistence that it is turned into it's turned into a fragment into a fragment of a city that it once know but which as such allows two things to happen or one major thing to happen one is to get the tower on a scale on a par with the rest of the city so this is the center of booming philadelphia and on the other hand you have these small uh, historical fragment of the city that allows people to continue to um, relate to that building whilst entering behind that, so with a certain amount of uh, irony as well. And then we come here to what I think is what is great masterpiece, the Pavilion for the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, which houses, again, a very important relic, artifact, in the history of the United States, which is in line with uh, with the Philadelphia Monumental Axis. Now, 
What they do here, it's something that is reminiscent of the Wright Brothers Pavilion, in a sense that there is a sense of research for the tension of the program and the organization of the section in such a way as to emphasize the space, the object, and what the object moves towards. So you can see this is on the, the other side, the side towards the institutional axis with the, um, with the bell here, and there is a a, um, uh, the tilting of the roof, which essentially re remain, reminds us of what happens in the right pavilions and to a certain extent what happened in the Palazzo dei Congressi. Then as we enter the building, we don't actually get into a pavilion in the same way as you would move into a car dealer. But you had to follow a very precise and designed route. So the circulation is the most important part of this building. And he used to tell me, Paolo, any time you look at one of these, uh, this, this object here, circulation is the key. It's not the way it looks. And so essentially what happens, you enter from the side, you go here, you go all the way, you progress toward the bell, and you actually get exactly the same feeling that you'd have got in Boston and you move towards the institution, once you've seen that it opens up to you and you realize that this was the instrument to which that institution is created, you actually move out on both sides. Once you move out on the side, the building doesn't lose its, its poignancy, and the reason for that is that it's still part of a public space. And so what happens is that there is a slight um, um, incline here that somehow corresponds to the section of the building. So there are drawings here that show you how the building sits within the public space as opposed to being only preoccupied with the central axis of the building. Now these buildings here were doing during the New York Life chapter of Jurgola's uh, professional life, which in some ways signals, I think, the apex of his um, professional career. But then in 1977, he becomes resident professor of architecture at the Academy, American Academy in Rome. So he goes back to Rome, and these are his sketches from the, the Gianicolo Hill down to uh, the river. And while he's there, he actually gets the, the um, um, Jefferson Medal at the University of Virginia, and eventually, a couple of years later, it will be made, possibly even as a result of his residency here, a foreign member of the uh, Academia di San Luca, which is the oldest academy of architecture in the world, and it's based in Rome. Um, this part is important. And I'm, remember that I'm taking you to Parliament House. Okay? It is important because while he's in Rome, in 77, 77, 78, there is an exhibition which is called Interrupted, the Interrupted City. Roma Interrotta, organized by Piero Sartogo, in which architects are given, a number of architects are given segments of a particular plan of Rome, which is called the Pianta del Nolli, which was done in 1748, and they actually asked to continue building Rome as if the Pianta del Nolli had not been interrupted. Now this is interesting because Nolli is the printer, the engraver, the Piranesi was an apprentice to. So Piranesi contributed to Pianta del Nolli, and his own Pianta uh, di Roma delle Antichità degli Acquedotti is eight years after this one. So Giurgola becomes an apprentice to Nolli in the same way as Piranesi was an apprentice to Nolli 150 years, 170 years earlier, and they take a particular section which runs along the Servian walls. Something like this. This is a photograph made by a photographer at the American Academy where Jurgola was staying. And so within a portion of the wall like that, they actually start designing a city that develops along the wall with housing, services, infrastructure. And there are some drawings here that are some of the most uh, meaningful, I think, um, for that particular period of time, would one consider that architecture, urban design, and urban engineer, could, engineering could actually go together. So when we look at them, we can see that they conceive the walls not as a static element or dead element, but some, something that could actually incorporate elements of transportation, of, um, 
of leisure, of connectivity between one part of the city, the built one, and the part of the city that would actually be preserved for the use of everyone. It's interesting that in this particular competition, if you look at the section and if you know the work of the firm, you'll see that all the sections of the firm, small buildings, large building, appear here. So there is an attempt to reflect on the work that was done and try and find new applications for that in new um, conditions. All the way to um, the Basilica, Michelangelo Basilica, in which they imagine, not Michelangelo, yeah, Michelangelo, the, the, the conversion, and so they imagine these axes that becomes a green axis and there is a great amphitheatre that looks at that, even in the modern time. Um, while he's there, while he's doing Roma Interrotta, someone from Australia rings him and asks him whether he would like to be the judge for a competition for the new government, the new parliament of um, the Australian Commonwealth, which would then become the largest public building competition in the world. And Jurkola says, not really. I don't want to participate. I don't want to be a judge. I want to participate. And so he does participate, and in 1978, is declared the winner of that competition out of, I can't remember, I think 756 entries. And so what happens with this particular project? This is Capitol Hill, and this is the triangle designed by Walter Burley Griffin in the 1920s for the design of the new Capitol Camber, and then there is one axis, which is the axis that brings the Capitol Hill to the mountain, Mount Esley, which is right here, which is, of course, reminiscent of Washington, is reminiscent of Delhi, and is reminiscent of all the uh, sort of city beautiful uh, master plans that we had done um, over the previous 100 years. So Jurgola sits himself, positions himself right here as per competition requirement, but makes the building disappear. And he makes the building disappear by taking advantage of the infrastructural system, so the road system here, and then another one. So in a sense, the city continues, and this particular place doesn't become the place where people go and stop, but it becomes an element of contiguity and positioning within, uh, within the city. There is a party here, so there is an axis that continues the axis of the old parliament and the essentially the, the promenade, promenade of um, heroes, if you will. And then he designs the building, the program of the building with a number of different parts. Different parts that because of these infrastructural components, if you will, become partially visible. So the program is not to be seen as a, as a, as a whole building, but rather as something that expresses the various function of the building. So this is the, the, the representative component, this is the government component, and these are the office buildings from the Senate and the Chamber of Representatives that need to function in another way. So this is a building that in a sense has uh, everything because it's got a reminder of the symbolism that he found in the old institutions in his room, but also the fact that those institutions, in order to be real, uh, visible, and vital, would have to be, in a sense, deconstructed, rearticulated in something that was not readable as a solid, but rather as a series of layers and components. Then another thing that he does is that he puts morphology, topography, the lie of the land, even though it is a it is artificial lie of the land, because in the same way as the Roman used the aqueducts, he actually uses this particular curb in order to, to, um, to store all the services of the building. Very much in the same way as the relics of Imperial Rome, the Republican Rome, the Piranesi was showing in his plan, have actually, were actually doing in Jurgola's time and are still doing today. And so what it does at the same time is to do exactly what his proposal for the, for the, um, for the Roma Interrota was doing, that is trying to bring the city and the country, nature and urbanity together by essentially through an element, not only of the vision, 
which is the wall, but also of connection between two parts of the landscape, the one which is inhabited by men and the one that is inhabited by ideas, if you will. Now, if you actually look back at the plan and look at Piranesi's Campo Marzio, you could actually play a game and start cutting elements from Piranesi's Campo Marzio and put them here. And at the end of the day, you would actually get Parliament House. Now, it's not an exercise in postmodernism, or, or only partially so, but it's also a fact that there are these two projects that are highly connected, in a sense, culturally and in terms of sensibility, and sensibility towards the city and in the sensibility towards the um, environment. So much so that, in fact, Jurgola decides not only to divide the building in a series of components, but actually use the building to add to the existing buildings. So this is the only proposal out of 756 that decides that the existing parliament, which was to be replaced, should become part of the composition of the new building. All the other proposals had the building still sitting on the hill, but without establishing any visual connection with the existing one. Now, this building took seven, no, 10, 11 years to build. And it was the building that I used as my thesis for graduation. So I spent a year on this construction site trying to understand how this building was built. In the meantime, Jurgola was doing other things. So he was working for the, Volvo, for the Volvo company, and he built the headquarters in Switzerland, a project that took almost 10 years, which Kenneth Frampton credits for having alerted him and awakened his interest in production, in work, labor, and production. And interestingly, Frampton is seen here with Jurgola at Columbia University in the early 80s because as a younger man, had replaced Jurgola as the Ware Professor at Columbia University. Jurgola continues to work while he's there, and this is one of his um, pastel sketches of the, arc of the of Parliament House under construction, but at the same time starts working on three other projects, very small projects. It's projects that don't actually use his office, but only use his own self as, um, as labor, as designer, and as um, critic. The first one is a very small church, St. Thomas Aquinan, that was completed in 1989. And you can see that this church has echoes that are very, very clear to me, possibly not in this drawing, if you consider how that would turn around, of the Escherich House, done by Louis Kahn, uh, finished by Louis Kahn 20, 25 years earlier. And you have lots of sketches that actually show how this distant connection might have uh, worked. Then you have another project, St. Patrick Cathedral in Parramatta 1999, in which you can see two other things. The first one is the car park at the University of Pennsylvania. The church has almost exactly the same functional programmatic structure of the garage. Uh, even though it's a different building type. So you have a nave of the, of the basilica, and then you have the functional component of the basilica, no longer the ramps of the car park, but rather all the implements of the altar that are actually hidden behind this three-dimensional structure. At the same time, there are elements that come from the construction of Parliament House, particularly polished concrete that looks like granite, and elements that come from other projects that date 30 or 40 years earlier. For instance, the roof. The roof goes back to the Palazzo dei Congressi. It certainly goes back to, um, um, to the Wright Brothers Pavilion. And it does betray this continuing ongoing interest in the, if you will, in the, um, in the engineering side of architecture. I haven't shown you, actually I have the, the next one. This is, these are two options of the same church that recall quite closely Libera's solutions for the Palazzo dei Congressi, in particular the tension components of the Molion system of the, of the internal um, of, of the curtain wall that is here. These are not the ones that are eventually used, but certainly there is an interest in using technical details as a way of showing the, you know, the strength and the tension of the building. And then there is the third building here 
which is, is what he called the Casa di Campagna, his own country house. This is the only building that Aldo Giurgola ever built for himself and for his daughter, Paola. Casa di Campagna on a lake. It was built in 2004, not so much as a house, but as an atelier, as a painting room. And the painting room from what? From which one could see the lake and the region beneath it. Now, if we look at the Casa di Campagna from an architectural technological point of view, you see that actually becomes the scent, the kernel, the concentration of everything that it done, because it is classical, and yet it defies, denounces that classicism. And he uses diagonal components that are actually there in order to separate parts of the program in things that they want to do separately, without grandness, but you know, prosaically in a sense. It's about everyday life. And then you have other solutions in, uh, in, uh, in section that allow light to come in, but there is another Oculus behind here, that allow light to go into the room at particular times of the day, depending on what they're doing and where they're actually putting the easel and how they want the room to be um, lit up naturally, when the landscape behind or in front of it changes colors. Now, at the end of all this, I'm going back to the painting that Germany showed, which is the, the portrait that Mandy Martin did for Jurgola, with Jurgola's consent and participation in 2005. This painting has three buildings in it. The first one is the church of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's hardly, too, hardly recognizable. Nevertheless, you have to take my word for that. The third one is the house, La Casa di Campagna. And the central one is Parliament House. This is the atrium of Parliament House. And this is Parliament Hill, the hill, Capitol Hill. And Mandy Martin says that this is a painting that ra does represent his life. It represents his rootedness. So his roots are in the soil of Australia, in the buildings of Australia, and in the colors and the materials of Italy, the sun-drenched region of southern Italy where his father was born, and the rightly, slightly more arid region uh, near Venice where his mother was born. Now the question is, where is America? There is no America here. There is Italy, there is Australia. How can it be? If you can see that, his, his, his life, there are four cities in his life that made him who he was. Rome, Philadelphia, New York, and Canberra. Now, you can't do away with Rome. Rome is the, the foundation, literally, is the, is the, is the humus, is the, is the habit, is the culture is everything that he carries with him in his bag when he goes to America. Now, America is the soil. It's the fertile soil that he finds to plant the seeds of his youth in Rome. And the soil becomes very fertile because of the people that he's with. First in Philadelphia, and then in New York. So possibly Jurgola's personality would develop out of his American period, but not without considering his Roman, um, his Roman uh, um, imprinting, if you will. It is true, though, that at the end of the 1970s, the momentum, the impetus of the office in America seemed to sort of lose um, steam. So it was still a very, very successful office, but because of the success, the office had expanded. It was still an office that was producing architectural quality, but at the corporate level, and of a scale that would not allow the partiality of the vision to be considered anymore. So we're not doing small buildings in the city, but they were actually producing large citadels of, uh, you know, of, of, of corporations in the middle of America. And the other thing is that possibly because of this, uh, um, in a sense, they lost its centrality in the architectural debate. So if this is the case, it could mean 
that Parliament House becomes a different uh, animal altogether. Because if it's not, in a sense, if there is not something which is distinctive of America, well, it could very well be that Parliament House represents America itself. And if that is the case, it becomes a very, very important building because it does try and say something about the 40 years after the war in which a number of ideas about the city, about architecture, and about the connection of them through technology and representation, um, where to develop or where not to develop. And so, in fact, Parliament House is something very strange because it's not Australian. And it's not Australian because you use a particular symbolism, because you use particular construction methods that had to do with the scale of the building and representations that were not Australian. And it was not American in the sense that it left America. It certainly was not international, partly because the modern movement has ceased to be, and partly even because the the, the, the movement existing post the modern movement had already had a, an end date um, written on its history. And so because of that, we could actually consider Parliament House as a critical artifact in, in asserting and defining, if you will, the, 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 the fate and the natural development of the history of modern architecture has it developed be before the war, through the transition of war, through the exchanges that were determined by the end of hostilities, and through the developments that went on specifically in America until the 1980s. So if this was the case, maybe that Parliament House and the other buildings that, the three buildings done after that, essentially reflect something more than a simple architectural progression. Jurgola made them by himself, not with his firm. And by the time the building was finished, he became, remained a consultant to the firm, but not, not the director of the firm. So it could be the Parliament House does represent, as many commentators in America believe, the Casa di Campagna. The, the refuge, the, the retirement home of someone who had a very long life uh, spending you know, different continents and 50, 60 years of architectural, uh, of, architectural, um, of architectural activity, whom at one point may not have found the development of architecture and you know, CD planning and city design as interesting as it would have been 40 or 50 years ago. And so he decided to retire at the top of this mountain and possibly pretend to be a novel Piranesi, the same apprentice as he was to Nolli as Piranesi was to, was to him. And if this makes this building, I think, and I think it does make this building very important in the history of architecture, if that transition was so critical, also reinforces, I think, from a personal point of view, the importance of encounters. The importance of encounters, such as the one that I had with him, at, if you will, at a station, at a transit station that was important for me, was critical for me, possibly was very important for him, and I had not realized it. And so if I reflect back on those years and that time, and that the plate of spaghetti, the bowl of pasta that we had that night 30 years ago, you can't cease to appreciate the importance of the lessons that were learnt before that bowl at that table that I think should remain, for what I've been trying to say, should remain the compass for anyone interested in this journey across the land of architecture at the center of the world, which at the time would have been America, as well as the boundaries. Australia for me and your own for yourselves. Thank you very much. Hello. 
I think the passion, the emotions, the detailed analysis, and a thorough knowledge of an architect's work are very rarely seen in this auditorium. And today was the day when both Jaimini and Paolo talked about an architect's, a true master's work with both incredible passion and emotions. I mean, I'm speechless. Thank you, incredible. Very good, very good. So, yes, wait, wait. No, one, one, one more minute. And I'm very happy that we did this because Paolo had come for something else and we got hold of for something else. And thanks, Gemini, because it was Gemini's idea that we should do this lecture. And I immediately took this up and had to fight a lot with SAP, with this Archipri and many other things to get this lecture done. So I'm so happy to both of you. Thank you. It's just incredible. I mean, yeah, one minute. I just want. So I'm going to go through, open it up because I wanted to say that this was very good of both of them to kind of give back to SAP in spite of their busy schedule. So anyway, I'm going to open it up for the questions here. was at Columbia in the 80s. Um, Ken Preston and Bob Stern and those people are, you know, certainly familiar to me. Um, but I took a course from Aldo and I thought I would be maybe amusing to tell you a little bit about it. Um, there's two things that are antecedent to the story. One of them is that before I went to uh, architecture school, I was in Chicago and I was interested in architectural history as was the order of the day in the 80s. And so I took a lot of Renaissance architecture history courses with a guy named Earl Rosenthal, who was at the University of Chicago. And I took five classes from him at the graduate.